Glasgow and Edinburgh have never been the worst of enemies, but they've never been the best of friends either. Politicians squabble about transport links and shopping malls. Locals and tourists argue which is prettier, livelier and friendlier. But the two cities, only 45 miles apart, do have one way to settle their differences on the rugby field. Glasgow Warriors and Edinburgh prepare to battle it out for the 1872 Cup. That means that there will be no peace or goodwill on the pitch this Christmas. The 1872 Cup is one of the biggest prizes in Scottish rugby, played for by the professional teams of Glasgow and Edinburgh. But as the trophy's current name suggests, the fixture between teams representing Glasgow and Edinburgh is one of the oldest in rugby history. The 1870s were a time of great change for organised sport in Scotland. A number of amateur clubs playing both rugby football and association football had begun to emerge in Glasgow, the biggest city in Scotland, and in Edinburgh, the nation's capital. In 1870, Scotland and England played a series of unofficial association football matches and the roots of the first Glasgow-Edinburgh rugby clash can be traced directly to those early fixtures. Now in this series of games, England won, of the five games, England won three and two were drawn. And it was this really that really energised the football clubs of Scotland to say this isn't on. There was a bit of bad feeling in Scotland. They, they, they seemed to feel with some justification that this wasn't really truly representative. With players drawn entirely from the London area, the Scottish team featured only one man actually born in the country. And many in the team had fairly tenuous connections to Scotland. They simply went round London and picked anyone who had any loose connection whatsoever with Scotland. One guy who liked whiskey, and that was his connection, and another guy who used to tra travel north to shoot grouse every year. Feeling that grievance that the nation hadn't been fairly represented in these matches, the rugby clubs of Scotland combined to send a challenge letter to England published in The Scotsman and Bell's Life. Sir, there is a pretty general feeling among Scotch football players that the football power of the old country was not properly represented in the so-called international football match. Almost all the leading clubs play by the rugby code. We, as representing the football interests of Scotland, hereby challenge any team selected from the whole of England to play us a match, 20 aside, rugby rules. And they laid down a challenge which the main clubs of England, the rugby clubs, took up. And that led directly to the, the famous game at 20 aside on Edinburgh Academicals ground at Rayburn Place in Edinburgh. And so, on March the 27th, 1871, international rugby began. But it was a very different game to the one we know now. The big emphasis nowadays is about open rugby, passing the ball. That was actually frowned upon in those days. There's a guy, Harry Stevenson, um, refused to play for Scotland because he didn't like the way that the selectors were picking guys that liked to pass the ball. He didn't believe that's the way it should go. It was really just a big wrestling match. Um, you'd have 16 guys all in together wrestling for the ball. These malls would last for eight, ten minutes. Um, there's a great passage in um, the diary of a guy called James Wallace who played for Aki's about that time. He talked about being in these malls lasting for eight to ten minutes and guys being dragged out by their ankles, exhausted or crushed. The match was a low-scoring affair and with no points awarded for tries in these days, Scotland were the victors by the score of one goal to nil. William Cross of Glasgow Academicals, converting after Angus Buchanan of Royal High School, had touched down. This was also a time before referees, the match regulated by two umpires, one of whom was a pioneer of Scottish rugby, Helly Hutchinson Almond of Loretta School in Musselburgh. Even back then, the umpire's role was challenging, as he explained in his own account of the game's most controversial moment. 
I do not know to this day whether the decision which gave Scotland the try from which the winning goal was kicked was correct in fact. I must say, however, that when an umpire is in doubt, I think he is justified in deciding against the team which makes the most noise. They're probably in the wrong. Scotland won that game and that was really the catalyst for a rapid growth in popularity for the game in Scotland and really the Glasgow-Edinburgh game grew out of this newfound popularity. It was decided by the clubs of Scotland to better prepare themselves for the succeeding international matches. They would organise an intercity rugby match, which effectively would come as a trial. It was decided that this first intercity match would take place in Glasgow. The venue would be Burn Bank, just off Great Western Road, home of one of the sides heavily involved in establishing the fixture. It was a ground that was used for many purposes. For instance, it was a home of the Glasgow Academicals Rugby Club, football club. It was a home of the Caledonian Cricket Club, and in fact, representative cricket was played there. It was also, for a short period of time, home to Glasgow Rangers. And so on the 23rd of November, 1872, sides representing Glasgow and Edinburgh met for the first time on a rugby field. The Glasgow side was comprised mainly of players from Glasgow Academicals and west of Scotland, with one from Glasgow University. The Edinburgh side was more disparate, with Edinburgh Academicals providing six of the 20, the others being drawn from Royal High School, Craigmount, Wanderers, Merkistonians and the University. Well, it was played um, 20 a side, um, 13 forwards on each side. It was just the only one score in the game by Tom Marshall of Edinburgh Ackies, a drop goal. He'd already played in two internationals, the, uh, the first one, of course, that uh, Raymond placed in 1871. There was a strange quirk to that game, that effectively that match was played under the auspices of the English Rugby Union. And it was a quite easy to explain that, because there was no rugby union in Scotland. The Scottish Rugby Union, or its original name, the Scottish Football Union, was not formed until a meeting was held in Glasgow Academy in 1873. So they had simply signed on for the governing body in England in order to be able to play under a consistent set of rules. At the same time as the first intercity rugby football match was being planned, Moves were also being made to play the first official international association football match. At the heart of this was Scotland's first association football club. Queen's Park decided they would hold a trial match for this first soccer international. And as there were not that many football clubs in, in, in existence then, they invited some of the players that were getting prepared to play in the intercity match against Edinburgh, they actually invited them for a trial. Two Glasgow academicals, uh, Tom Chalmers and Willie Cross, took part in the first ever soccer international trial, which was strangely also held at Burn Bank on the 20th of November, 1872. But they were either not selected by Queens or they simply decided to give priority to the intercity. In the first few years, matches were played on a home and away basis. But after four years, it was decided they would just be played once a year in Glasgow. In these days, only goals counted. And if you scored only tries, they, did, they didn't count. And there was a succession of uh, six draws in the series. Sadly for the Glasgow contingent, it was nine years before Glasgow actually were able to say that they had won the inter-district match between them and Edinburgh. It was an opportunity really for the players to, to shine and sort of move up another level and strut their stuff before the international selectors. And that opportunity has worked its way right through to the present day. By the time we got to the 1880s, it was, it was strange that really for the last 20 years of the um, 19th century, up to the turn of the century, Glasgow were the dominating force. And of the 20 games played, Edinburgh only won on four occasions. By that time, the, the, the venue had become Hamilton Crescent from 1873 onwards, and it became known as the Graveyard of Eastern Hopes. 
In the early years of the 20th century, Edinburgh regained the upper hand in fixtures, losing only once. Before matches and sport in the country as a whole were halted by the onset of the Great War. From this distance in time, it is difficult really to uh, understand the massive loss of life sustained generally, but particularly by sports clubs and, and rugby clubs. For example, the Glasgow side of 1913-14 was again very much dominated. Uh, it was a mixture of, particularly by that time, Glasgow High School FP and Glasgow Academicals. And the Glasgow Academical side of 13-14, of the 15 players, um, eight were killed and six were wounded. And, and, and that was sort of, a, a really, it focuses the, the massive loss of life to, to Scottish rugby. Uh, and it was mirrored across the, you know, right across the nation. Each year in a ceremony at Murrayfield, the Scottish rugby community paid tribute to those who made the supreme sacrifice. The intercity fixture moved to New Annie's Land in 1922 as the country recovered from the Great War. Rugby played its part in this as the crowds flocked to domestic games, keen to see the star names involved. In 1922, Edinburgh turned up with an interesting back division. And on the wing, there was a young man who was noted, he seemed to have a bit of speed in his legs. He certainly could cover the turf out there. And it must have been a nightmare for the Glasgow winger of the day, Max Simmers, to try and mark him. Some big names played. Eric Little in the 1920s played for Edinburgh University, then played for Edinburgh against Glasgow, played seven times for Scotland and scored tries for Scotland. And then a couple of years after that, in 1924, he went on and won his gold medal at the Paris Olympics. Hugely talented man, but that gives you some idea of the calibre of person who was playing rugby at the highest levels at that time. Imagine being able to pull on the blue jersey of Scotland in the winter and then simply change your studs for your spikes and, and go out and take on the greatest athletes in the world and, and so doing break the world record. It, it was just a phenomenal story. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the intercity matches began again. Selected to play for Edinburgh in 1946 was Gilbert Kennedy father of 1984 Grand Slam winner Ewan. While it was a great honour to be chosen, players still had to provide much of their own clothing. Completely different era. Um, you know, the, uh, there wasn't even the organisation that we had. You know, it was real amateur days when my father played, amateur days when I played, and it's now fully professional. So probably that's the best way of trying to describe it. As rugby moved into the swinging 60s, the television cameras arrived. Rugby special comes to you from Scotland for the very first time this season. In fact, from the home of Hillhead High School FB here at Hewenden in Glasgow. This is one of the oldest established representative fixtures on the Scottish calendar. 96 years old, and over that time, of course, there's grown up a tremendous tradition of rivalry between Glasgow and Edinburgh. But it's much more than just that. It is, in a sense, a trial for a trial. And all aspiring Scotland players knew that being picked for that trial match was vital for international selection. By this point in the 60s, the intercity contest had evolved to become part of the inter-district championship, where Glasgow and Edinburgh competed with sides representing the North and Midlands as well as the South, and on occasion, the Anglo-Scots. That's Sandy Carmichael, the international kite head. It was your apprenticeship which I always took it, and I think it was a very good apprenticeship. Was there. That's we were playing against people who were internationalists, you know, present internationalists, so you were taking the tips off them. You learnt a lot. Alan, the great chance here for Alan, giving it to McLaughlin. McLaughlin's going to score for Glasgow, and he has. Very much a step up and everybody wanted to play for the district. And obviously we're playing with the best players in Glasgow, 
uh, or the west of Scotland. It was incredibly competitive. I mean, it was a, it was a big honour and a big stepping stone to play for your district. And I suppose the, the intercity, in some ways, was that little bit more special because I think it's one of the longest running games on record. I remember the first time I got selected for Edinburgh. Um, it was a great thrill because, of course, you'd watch them over many, many years as a young kid and, and growing up. Every district game was basically a trial. All the selectors were there watching, so you had this. You had to produce a, a big performance. Those rivalries were, were, were well documented before the game, usually by the press, and usually after the game, uh, the press came out and said who they thought had won that particular duel. The Glasgow side of the late 60s and early 70s was a strong one with a hugely formidable front row. At one point, the Glasgow front row, for instance, was the international front row. Ian McLaughlin, Mighty Mouse, uh, Quinton Dunlop, Sandy Carmichael. Uh, of course, behind them, they had Big Gordon Brown as well. So, pretty good start if you were in the Glasgow team with a, a pack like that. This was, the, this was the chance to take the other guy, or your opposition, out the game of being selected. I remember there was one Glasgow um, individual who um, was a very prominent player, um, won't say any more than that, but he was kicking lumps at one of his best pals from Edinburgh and afterwards denied all knowledge of it. You had to beat Edinburgh. They, they were the kind of soft boys from the east and uh, you had to take them. The one I remember particularly was 1968. Quite a few players had to go off the field for attention to injuries. And there was no replacements in these days, no temporary replacements were, were allowed. That's Brown number four, the big west of Scotland lock forward who's followed. And Glasgow decided, because we were so short of numbers, that they would play only the front row, which you can't do now, you've, you've got to have a minimum of five. And you see there their depleted scrummage. My goodness, they've won it. That was pretty good. Out to Simmers. This is out one man. Oh, what good effort there by Allen. And Allen has given a try to Shedden. And my goodness, if that's not a feather in Glasgow's cap, I don't know what is. In the early 80s, there can be no doubt that the dominant force in district rugby was actually the South, made up of players from Scottish rugby's borders, Heartland. Oh, lovely try there for Jim Rennick. That was brilliant. It took a strong Edinburgh side to knock them off their perch. Edinburgh had been well beaten in the early 80s uh, by the south of Scotland for the Inter-District Championship. And between sort of 86, 87, 88 um, and 89, they, got, they managed to string three successive championship victories together. But at that point in time, so sort of the borders were still the sort of heart of Scottish rugby. The Edinburgh City Clubs would uh, r revel in the chance to go down to the borders and pick off the south of Scotland. Those are the games which are probably more akin to Edinburgh Glasgow now um, because really both teams would be packed full of internationalists, all with the individual rivalry going on, all trying to win for the team but you know you, you wanted to get one over on your opposite number. I played for the South and then later the borders and district rugby and we were actually jealous of this fixture. We knew it had uh, a lot of history back to 1872 so when Edinburgh and Glasgow were playing against each other we felt we were missing out down in the, in the South. Gavin Hastings already with two successful goals so far. And it's a beauty. It left his foot like a meteorite and went dead straight. It was amazing. Edinburgh rugby, they had a lot of brothers. There was Stuart and David Johnson, there was myself and Scott, the Hastings, they had the Calders, the Brewsters, the Scots, the Milnes. There was a real brotherhood, if you like, of, of guys. And we all played for different uh, clubs. so. You can imagine the banter in the change rooms when we got together. I mean, it was rubbish. Finley Calder held it in beautifully. That was a good bit of work by the, the flanker who's used to playing flanker. Feed John there to Jim curling round, and that's the try for Edinburgh. And uh, the two Calder brothers have done it. With John up there in the lock position, Finlay held it well in the, in the scrummage that eased round, and then Jim came round, took his pass, and drove over. My brother John got a, a selection for Edinburgh before I did. I was off on holiday in Tenerife and uh, he came, came back 
to find that John had played against Newcastle. The letter had gone to the wrong house, and my brother John got his first game for Edinburgh in my position. So you can imagine uh, there was a bit of brotherly discussion about that. Uh, in fact, they called him Jim in the training session, so uh, just to confirm that it should have been me. <laughs> the 80s didn't bring much success for representative rugby in the West. But as the decade came to a close, Glasgow took the inter-district championship with a new young team that remained unbeaten for the season. We were the kind of poor relations at that time. Uh, we, we had a lot of guys who were on the, on the verge of international honours, um, but we just weren't uh, getting picked. It was good to sort of stick your hand up and be sort of say, look, don't forget about us. You know, we can represent our country too, and we want to represent our country. Winning the inter-district championship for the first time in however many years, um, was, a, was a massive honour for me. Well, just to be in a Glasgow team that uh, wins consecutively was good back in the day. We didn't win too many district championships back then. Contests between the cities took on a whole new dimension in the mid-90s as the districts evolved into professional rugby teams. And while matches are now league fixtures in the Rabo Direct Pro 12, some things haven't changed. The beauty of the 1872 Cup is probably its traditional old values rather than the advent of professionalism. Um, and that's that winning at all costs. It's getting one over your mate. It's a derby atmosphere. It's the fans really have an ownership of their team. Glasgow Edinburgh games now are fantastic, clearly. I mean, obviously, with there being only two professional sides, there's a real intensity and a real rivalry that perhaps maybe didn't even exist when we played. It's grown massively in the last few years. Um, you're, you're playing against your rivals, there's league points up for grabs, there's obviously the element of the, the Scotland selectors are watching it and you're playing, a lot of guys are playing against guys who have uh, got their jersey or vice versa. As a player they're good matches to play and they're always you know, keenly contested. Uh, sometimes they're a bit scrappy, you know, because everybody's so, so desperate. I was at a cop or two um, at the start of the season and a couple of people I met from Glasgow only wanted to talk about uh, the, the derby games, so it's, uh, you know, it has a obviously pride of place. While the game has moved on in many ways, the contests are still full-blooded affairs where passions run high. One of the games in, in Glasgow, maybe two, three years ago, was ended up with a couple of red cards at the end of the game. And Scott uh, McLeod and Chris Fazzaro were right at the final whistle. And of course, as soon as the final whistle went, it meant nothing. So the effect of percent off in two cans meant nothing, but just the intensity of the game for the 80 minutes is uh, that's pretty special. Jim Hamilton and I over the years have uh, knocked lumps to each other, but we're good mates. Uh, and a lot of that came in the Edinburgh Glasgow games. And that's right across the board. Like, it'll be a hard physical game, and we'll step off the park and we'll go up the stairs and we'll have our meal together as we always would. I remember um, Jim McLaren, the centre, used to play for Glasgow. It was a freezing cold night and he gave me a few old shoe and two or three times over and I just burst out laughing because he had mouldies on. And I, I was like, Jim, you've got mouldies on. <laughs> so it had absolutely zero effect and then he burst out laughing at the same time, so we spoke about that for a while. And just as in the first match 140 years ago, a good performance in the intercity clash can make all the difference when it comes to international selection. And a month later, these guys could be playing for Scotland. So if they can get an edge on their opposite number, who they're playing against, the Scotland players have got something to really fight for. Players will be friends when they're in the Scotland camp and they're not at the autumn test where they've just been a few weeks before. But as soon as they play against each other, they're very competitive and uh, the tackle's going that little bit harder in these games. There'll be players who, you know, are maybe a little bit hot-headed at times, so you'll try and get under their skins. There's other players that, uh, you, you know, that you can do certain things, maybe tactically, that will help. Um, I love it. I love playing against the players that, you know, uh, I think that there's nothing better. I remember I was captain through in Glasgow two or three seasons ago, and Al Kellett was captain in Glasgow, and the referee called us to toss the coin before the match. It was meant to be like half an hour before kick-off, and Big Al never turned up. And I thought, come on, Al, you know, you're, <laughs> you're not going to pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> in all honesty, it's having no effect. And the referee says, no, we're going to wait for him. I said, right. I said to the referee, do you really think I'm going to stand here waiting? He knows exactly what he's doing. So I'll run away, did my warm up. Eventually, Al came out and we tossed the coin. And I said to him after, I said, what are we trying to do? He said, oh, I just couldn't get my boots on. <laughs> in recent years, the home and away fixtures have been played over the festive period. 
giving the fans two Christmas crackers in the space of a week. We had a fantastic crowd here uh, last, last Christmas and then, and then we, when we went down to Glasgow it was a, a full house down there so that, that, that atmosphere is great for the players, they enjoy that atmosphere and it brings out the best in them. It always seems there's a bit more edge in the crowd as well and uh, you know, that sometimes comes onto the pitch. Once the game starts, both sets of supporters get stuck into each other and that's great, it's great because you know, there is passionate rugby being played all over the world and I think sometimes Scotland just lacks for a wee bit of passion, but uh, certainly not in the Intercity match. I can remember playing, getting a whole load of abuse from the Glasgow fans when Edinburgh played at Watsonians, um, you know, one year, but, and that was the travelling support, but uh, good value, good times. Extra seats are being installed at Glasgow's new home in Scotston to cater for the added interest in the Derby fixture. And the crowd at Murrayfield will be even larger. Over 13,000 attended last year's clash. For paying customers, these two games are as good as it gets. It's just a perfect Christmas present. It's just the perfect game at Christmas. I think it's similar to Scotland playing England. I think it's the same kind of rivalry. For some, it's fierce. For others, just like a bit of banter. Good laugh, good crowds, good banter. I think it means uh, that we bit more to the fans, just because it's between the two sides. Well, we've struggled the last couple of years or so, <laughs> so we really need yeah. to win it this year. Edinburgh is the capital, but Glasgow's always the winners. Glasgow have been the winners of the 1872 Cup on the last three occasions by having the better aggregate score over the two ties. Last season's matches included an exciting draw at Murrayfield and a win for Glasgow at Fir Hill. Obviously, the, the league points for me are, are the most important thing. But then to win that trophy, uh, as much as anything, gives you the bragging rights when you come into the, the Scotland Cups. Both matches uh, were, were uh, very entertaining, and uh, the match here was a draw. Uh, with, with, with uh, you know, we should have won it. We got we got clear away from them last year. And if Glasgow have the edge at the moment, there's nothing more certain than that come the intercity matches. Edinburgh will want to take the honours. They'll want the bragging rights. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. And, and believe me, Edinburgh will be out to, to sort Glasgow out because, you know, it, it's one way of salvaging a, a very poor start to the season. Whether you're not a losing run or a winning run, it means nothing. It comes to the game, it's, uh, it's warfare. And I've been in, you know, teams who have won, you know, by a, by a long way. Uh, for Edinburgh and Glasgow, we've also been in the, on the wrong side a few hidings. So form means nothing. It's not just the supporters that get excited about these fixtures. For the coaches and players of both teams, with 140 years of history, bragging rights, league points and a trophy at stake, these matches are different to any other in the calendar. I'll be straight up about it. I don't think uh, uh, Glasgow like Edinburgh and Edinburgh don't like Glasgow, so you know you have an opportunity to get one over on your near neighbour in a sporting sense. We'll be looking, to get, looking forward to going through to Glasgow. Uh, to play in that game, uh, the fans always look forward to it, it's good for Scottish rugby. It's a big chance over the Christmas period to get good points on the board. Back-to-back -back wins for any team means that they'll be sitting well in the rabble. There aren't many opportunities to lift a trophy in rugby, in all honesty. That image and that, I suppose, culmination of the, the victory is really quite important, so it's great, to, it's great to have a trophy. It's rugby at its best. It's, it's hard, it's aggressive, it's giving absolutely everything for your team, for your jersey, and then it's stepping off the parking shaking the guy's hand and saying, well done, we'll see you next week.